Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest is musical folklorist and master musician Gerard Ettery, and we'll discuss his style and his career. Ettery received his Master's of Music from the Manhattan School of Music. He specializes in the music of the Sephardic Jews, whose culture includes repertoire from the Judeo-Arab, Judeo-Spanish, Argentinian, Middle Eastern, Northern European, and Eastern European musical worlds. He has been a featured artist for Carnegie Hall, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Center for Jewish History, and the Spirit of Fez Educational Outreach at Royce Hall in L.A. Gerard, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, this is, this is a special treat because later on we're going to have a performance uh, from you, which I think uh, everyone will appreciate. But before we get there, let's talk about how you got to where you are. Um, you're not a typical touring musician in the U.S., no, though very much, I'm very much a, a wandering minstrel and a troubadour in my soul. And part of how I got here is the multicultural influence that I grew up with. I was born in Morocco, Casablanca, which was then a French protectorate. So I grew up hearing French, and so French music, the music of Jacques Brel, Edith Piaf, Georges Brassens. I also grew up listening to tangos because my grandfather and great-grandfather had spent time in Argentina. I heard the music of the synagogue, so the chants of the chazans, they're called, the cantors. Uh, I heard the muezzin's call from the minarets in, uh, in the Muslim, uh, in the mosques. And, uh, and then, of course, the music of my heritage, which is Judeo-Spanish on my mother's side, Judeo-Arabic on my father's side. We then moved to Paris when Morocco gained its independence, spent the next four years in Paris and came to the States when I was about nine years old. And I grew up, you know, I was a teenager in the 70s, so the influences of Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, I was, I was a hippie <laughs> with my guitar on my back and hitchhiking everywhere that I could. Um, and throughout my teenage years, I uh, studied guitar, flamenco, classical, jazz, folk styles from all over the world, and I began to incorporate uh, these influences. It took a while because I felt like uh, I belonged everywhere and nowhere. Um, <laughs> but uh, in my late teens, I was roped into the family business. And uh, after spending almost five years working for my father, uh, I went and auditioned for the Manhattan School of Music in operatic performance, and I was offered a scholarship. And I spent the next 10 years uh, singing opera. And, uh, and then I came back to the, playing the guitar and singing in 1992 which was the year of the quincentennial commemorations of the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. I started getting calls from JCCs, synagogues, uh, festivals. And about four or five years after that, I was almost doing no opera and doing mostly my own concerts. I formed different musical ensembles. I created a music label. I now have 15 recordings of Sephardic music, a songbook. And uh, it's, it's a passion for me. It's a passion. So there's so many influences that have uh, informed really what I do today and, and really my identity. That, that's amazing. One of the things that I find interesting about that is, the, is that what organizes this or centers it maybe is the formal study that you did at, mm. at the Manhattan School. Right. So but that, that was very classical. That was really classical. And very rigorous. Very rigorous, <laughs> yes. And it was mostly opera. I mean, what is a, what is a typical school day like? Well, uh, you know, there are language classes, diction classes, music theory, um, stage movement, uh, opera practicum, uh, history. I mean, you know, what goes into being an opera singer, it's like you really have to accept to be an eternal student 
It's <laughs> like you never stop studying. You know, every role that you begin to do, you've got to research the historical period. You've got to know uh, what makes the character come alive, you know? And, and so the more you learn, the more you know. I used to go to museums and just look at paintings. And sometimes I'd see a painting that reminded me of my character. And I would look at that painting and all of a sudden the character would make sense. It was just in a posture. In, in a particular uh, physical, uh, facial expression. So you're always looking, always studying, and opera is a very jealous mistress. You can only really do that. And so for the 10 years that I did sing opera, I hardly picked up my guitar, even though I'd been playing since the age of nine. You know, there was no time for anything else. Well, it, there are auditions and, oh, and auditions rehearsals. And, and, and I'll and, tell you, <laughs> auditions and a lot of rejections. Yeah, I you get know. you get a pretty thick skin, I would imagine, as a working musician or actor. Um, and it's how, how do you not take that personally? Um, you do it for yourself. I remember when I started enjoying my auditions is when I started to experience the auditions as another opportunity to perform. I, start, I stopped putting the people who were listening to me in positions of such power. They're people, and maybe they'll like what I do, maybe they don't, but you have to do it for yourself first. Because that's, that's a rough, you know, we, we've been through a kind of a rough patch in the economy, yes. and a lot of folks who haven't had to do a lot of job interviewing before now are doing a lot of it and are struggling. It's true. And the it's life of a, of a performer is about that. That's a big, there's a lot more rejection than there is uh, accolades, Absolutely. I'm guessing. No, and I feel grateful. I mean, I, I, I count my blessings because I have created a niche for myself with this music, um, and, and it fits within a world music category because I, I don't just do Sephardic music. Um, and I create different programs. You know, as a freelance artist, you have to have irons on many fires to keep it going, you know. Well, New York is a pretty good place to be doing that. I, I, your s studio, your offices are in Upper West Side, is uh, right? Now I'm in Battery Park City. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I moved, I moved south. <laughs> I, I'm a block from the, uh, world, uh, from the World Trade Center. Really? Okay. Tower. But there's so much going on in New York that, that uh, reinforces, I'm guessing, your own experience growing up. So you speak a number of languages and you sing in... I sing in, in about 15 languages. Why? Because first of all, as an opera singer, you have to learn to sing in the Romance languages. So Italian, French, German, uh, Russian, some operas. Uh, so you learn not only the diction, but when you're studying a, a role, you want to really know what you're singing about. And of course, my native languages, which are French and Spanish, uh, when I do sing in French, Spanish, or Italian, um, I feel closer culturally, stylistically, because I know the language. You know, when I sing in French, it's like, like I'm talking to you now in English. My English is, has gotten to be okay. <laughs> and very often people say, you sing in all these languages. How come there's no CD of your music in English, you know? <laughs> but uh, but it's, it's, it's important in order to get into the skin of a character to really understand what they're saying. So around 92, 1492, uh, most Americans know it more as, uh, you know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but there was a lot going on in Spain there and was. in Europe, there and was. especially in your own tradition. You, mm -hmm. you wanna talk about that a little bit? And, sure. And what it means to be a Sephardic Jew? Yes. Um, Jews had been in the Iberian Peninsula since Roman times. And there was many, were many, many conquests, you know, by Muslims who came into Spain in 711. Uh, they pushed the Christians to northwestern Spain. Then the Christians reconquered uh, Andalusia primarily. And they uh, then kicked out the Moors and the Jews, and so there was a succession of, of uh, conquests that was even called La Reconquista, the reconquest of Spain. Many of the Jews, Moors, fled to North Africa and then came back when the regimes uh, eased a little bit. There were fundamentalist uh, Muslims that came up through the Sahara, a tribe called the Almohads, 
who imposed a much more fundamentalist, rigid uh, uh, Islam. Even uh, they rejected their, their own uh, brethren who were too liberal in their thinking. You know, what are you doing uh, mixing with, with Jews and Christians? And of course, there was a period of relative coexistence, what, what we refer to as a convivencia, between the three monotheistic faiths, um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And there was an exchange of ideas, literature, poetry, uh, texts were translated from Greek into Arabic and Hebrew, and it was not uncommon for people to speak five, six languages. And there was the language of the street, there was the language of the synagogue or the church or the mosque, and the boundaries between the secular and liturgical life was not so well defined. People lived their religion. So I'm also not idealizing the time. There were certainly conflicts. But it, I, I do like to think of the golden age of Spain as a template for what is possible between human beings, that there can be a peaceful, tolerant coexistence, which then opens up the mind to receive what people have to give, culturally, intellectually. And in 1492, um, as a result of, of the Inquisition, uh, based in Rome, it had a very long arm, uh, the monarchs at the time were King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Queen Isabella was very fanatically religious. And sometimes I wonder if it had been just King Ferdinand, because he was a much more moderate ruler, but he deferred to his queen. So they issued an edict of expulsion, which went something like, uh, like this, you know, uh, I, King Ferdinand, and Queen Isabella uh, have ordered the expulsion of all Jews from our kingdoms. Never should they return. If they are found living in our kingdoms and domains, they shall be put to death, 1492. And so, wow. so the Jews fled to North Africa, to the Ottoman Empire, which then comprised of the Balkans, Turkey, Greece. Uh, many went to Portugal first, but then the Inquisition happened in Portugal in, 1997, uh, in 1497. So they weren't safe there either. And then from Portugal, they moved into uh, Europe. Many went to Amsterdam. Uh, so there was a, a tremendous, uh, tremendously uh, expansive diaspora. And the Jews, the Sephardim, brought their culture, their language with them to these countries of the diaspora. They influenced those cultures and were influenced by those cultures in turn. Uh, and it gives you a very rich mix, not only in the literature, but in the music, sometimes you hear a song uh, in Ladino, Ladino being the ancient Castilian spoken by the Sephardim, uh, with choruses in Turkish, and then Hebrew is, is injected into the, into the verse because Hebrew remained the language of prayer and the language that united and continues to unite Jews wherever they might be. Well, if you hear a flamenco guitar, mm -hmm. You can't help but feel the Moorish influence Absolutely. there. I mean, we don't necessarily think of it. We think of the the costumes and the you know the castanets and all that. But the guitar itself is very to, to me very very Middle Eastern. One of the things that I find interesting is also a child of the '70s. Is you know I grew up listening to Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. I think everyone knows about the Beatles going to India. I'm not sure folks know how much Middle Eastern music. Uh, influenced some of that classic rock that we think about in the, in the 1970s. You, um, I, I had an opportunity to listen to you yesterday, and I was just, that, that really struck me, mm -hmm. and, and how enduring perhaps that musical style is. And, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that, that you, you specialize in these um, relig religious music, mystical music. What, what kinds of things do you think unite that type of music? What, what are common themes, uh, either musically or uh, experientially, and, and what makes the different traditions different from each other musically? Okay, first, um, the liturgical songs that I do, it's only one part of it. Uh, I, I 
do concerts of just you know secular love songs or or romanzas. Uh, you bring up a, an interesting point that needs to be addressed. What I'm doing is perpetuating an oral tradition, right? These songs have been passed on for centuries, and initially they were passed on by word of mouth. You know, the, before the advent of the printing press, you know, most cultures passed on their body of information, uh, their cultural wealth orally. Right, and, and, and so you, you wonder about how little we use our memories when you think that people passed on, you know, sometimes I find a ballad with 20, 25 verses telling a story. Um, and the melody is almost incidental. It's a mnemonic device really used to remember because it's easier to memorize something when you put it to a melody. And the these ballads, these stories were pa passed on primarily by women, right? Grandmothers, uh, daughters, you know, cooking in the kitchen, washing clothing by the river, at least this is the image that I have. And in order to make the daily labors more palatable, they would tell stories. During the diaspora, I think there was a, a, a very strong nostalgic element because they were always, when you read a lot of these ballads or hear a lot of these songs, they hearken back to how great it was in Spain, you know, to, to the beauty of, of the land. And like similarly in my, in my family, when they left Morocco, um, the older generation had a very hard time adjusting to France, to the United States, Canada, and they missed Morocco for the rest of their lives because life had been good there, you know. It had been good, and, and the connection with, with the Arabic population there was, was always very strong, and it was a very friendly uh, convivencia, you know, among the Jews and, and Arabs of Morocco. And so I grew up, of course, with a strong Arabic influence, and without having that, that antagonistic sense that you read about in the papers every day, you know, uh, Palestinians, Israelis, that there's, there's so much strife you know, that, you know, arguably doesn't need to be there. You know, when you make, when you politicize something, it, you stop seeing the person in front of you and uh, well, there it breaks been, the boundaries. There have been no shortage of people who have uh, taken advantage of nationalism or uh, re religion to further their own goals by exactly. getting people all kinds of whipped up about it. Exactly. Now, now, what's interesting to me is that with all this training you have, and uh, with the wide diversity of things that you do, you use a guitar. Yes. W what one guitar? And w why? Why a guitar? Why not something else? Why not the bongos or something well, else? Well, I think the guitar found me. You know, I picked up a guitar when I was nine, and it was like I just started playing it. You know, and 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 just loving it. And of course, during my conservatory studies, I had to study piano. You know, for theory. But the keyboard and I never really got along very well. <laughs> Whereas you put it, uh, any stringed instrument into my lap and I, it's almost like I know how to play it. Uh, it's something, uh, you, you know, I just love the guitar. And I think when I came back to performing this repertoire, uh, after having spent, as I say, 10 years in opera, almost not picking up my guitar, I realized how much I missed it, how much it was part of my musical persona. And even when I go into the recording studio, sometimes I'll separate the tracks, I'll do, you know, lay down the guitar tracks, I'll lay down the vocals, we'll lay down percussion. But sometimes, you know, my engineer says, why don't you just pick up your guitar and sing? Because there's a kind of energy that happens when I'm singing and playing at the same time. There's a phrasing that happens. There's, it's, it feels like a, another limb to me, you know, when I'm playing the guitar. Well, as we're going to find out in a few minutes, that, that's really true. Um, you play a classical guitar with well, nylon now, strings. Now right? I'm using a, a flamenco guitar, which mm -hmm. is nylon string. It's an offshoot, really, of a classical guitar. Um, and also, I want to go back to a point you made earlier. Uh, the guitar is a relatively new instrument. I mean, the ancestor of the guitar, and that's the real ancient instrument, is the oud, which is the Arabic lute. Mm -hmm. um, the guitar, even flamenco as we know it, is a relatively 
new form. It doesn't date back so far. And yet you hear the Moorish and the Jewish influences very powerfully in flamenco music. You also hear Eastern influences because they say that flamenco was brought from India by gypsies. Really? And so it's that gypsy, Jewish, Mediterranean influence that creates flamenco. When you hear a good flamenco singer and then you hear a good cantor from a synagogue or you hear a muezzin, the vocal style is very much the same. It's you know, nasal, very ornamented, right? They'll take a melody and they'll ornament the melody in, in a way that, that is completely unfamiliar to Western ears. You know, for us, a song is a three, four minute piece with a hook and, you know, and it's very, very structured. There, uh, musical time is very different. You know, people will sit and listen to music for three, four hours. Here, we go to a concert, you know, after an hour and a half, people get antsy. There, it's just beginning after an hour and a half. Well, do you use, a, this is for the guitar geeks out there, do you, do, do you use different tunings? Do you, I, I, what? Uh, That's a good question. How do you approach this? Uh, mostly, I like to stay in standard tuning. However, I do a drop to D tuning for sure uh, whenever I do something in D minor, or D major, or B minor, uh, which is the relative of, of relative minor of, of D major. Um, but then I will use uh, one, two tunings that I'm very fond of are DADGAD, D-A-D-G-A-D. -A -D. Why? Because it's very open, very modal. And I can make my guitar sound almost like an oud when I, when I use that tuning. It's very folk. It's very also, folk. Also, if you go it's to Louisiana very, blues, oh, I mean, that's totally. the, it's a lot of that in there. Totally. But, but a lot of Middle Eastern music, I mean, in order to draw a parallel, it's like... Uh, American blues, you know, there's a very strong element of improvisation or jazz, you know. Uh, you have the lead sheet, but then the musicians go off on a tangent. And that's, that's the beauty because, you know, we were talking about it uh, earlier, how it's about being in the moment with yourself. I mean, if you want to look at it from a spiritual, philosophical point of view, for me, there's a reflection of that in the music, right? That when you improvise, you don't know what's going to come next. You have, you start with a, a chord chart, but that's the surprise. That's the, the, the part that you never know. I've been doing certain songs now for, I don't know, most of my life. And every time I sing those songs, and I will do several at the concert tonight, it's a different experience. It's complete, it comes out differently, whether it's different rhythmically. Uh, I might em embellish the melody instead of the melody line. I may decide to sing the harmony as the melody line. Uh, I may speed up, slow down the tempo. I may expand an instrumental that I had actually uh, scored to be, you know, 30 seconds long. I go, oh, I I'm, I'm in the groove tonight. My fingers want to go here and here. So that's, that's really the, the interest and the excitement for a performer especially if you're doing the same repertoire again and again. Yeah, I mean, some of these folks that, um, that, that were huge in the 60s and 70s that are now doing, you know, the, the, the concert tours, you know, the, the make money tours, I don't know how it is they can do the same songs that are almost frozen in time it's for true. 40 years it's and, true. and still have that energy. And people expect to hear those songs the way they've listened <laughs> to those songs on records. You know? Right, and that's, uh, that must be hard. But one last question before I ask you, do you have groupies? Do I have groupies? <laughs> I, you know, I, Sephardic groupies. I feel, I feel very humble. Sometimes I, I go to a community and I'm like surprised by how many people know me. And I guess, you know, I've got like 60 or 70 YouTubes of live performances. I've got 15 recordings. And I've been doing this now since 1992. So I do have a fan base. But for me, it's just about being in the moment, availing myself of every opportunity to perform, whether it's for 10 people or 1,000 people, I see uh, what I do. I'm, I'm passionate about what I do, and I see it as an opportunity to share a, a very unusual repertoire to, to Western ears. And I must say, unusual even uh, in, in some Jewish circles, in, in the, Ashken the, the Ashkenazi, the Eastern European Jews, uh, we're, especially in this country, we're not very aware of Sephardic music and culture. So even among Jews, Sephardic music and culture uh, needed to be uh, expounded upon and, and spread, which I've been doing. I think there's, there's a 
much stronger awareness about this body of music than there was when I started. Well, do you mind sharing something with us? I'd be happy now? to. Um, I guess we're going to have you sit down over here and okay. and, uh, and and I'll do a song, uh, one of my favorite songs called "A la una yo nací," which means "At one I was born." I'll give you a quick translation: "A las dos me engrandecí, a las tres tomé amante, y las cuatro me casé." At two I grew up. At three, I took a lover, and at four, I married. Tell me, my young girl, where you come from? And if you have no lover, let me be the one to defend you. Going off to war, I blew two kisses into the air. One was for my mother, and one for you, dear love. Well, that's great. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to hear Gerard Ettery. Dime niña, ¿dónde vienes? Que te quiero conocer. Dime niña, ¿dónde vienes? Que te quiero conocer. Y si no tienes amante, yo te haré defender. Y si no tienes amante, yo te haré La la 